Corum. Mazad. Here's a little brief uh, introduction or story about my life. My name's Akil Khan. Um, I'm 29 years old. Um, basically, I'm letting you know about my life story. Basically. Okay. How I was on the drugs and alcohol? When I was in school, um, basically I wanted to make a bit of change at a young age, so I had to sell cannabis to my fellow pupils in school. I was only about what, 14, 15 at the time, I didn't have a clue you know, what it was when I was that, and he got mixed up in the wrong crowd and everything. I started when I was about 13 years old. Uh, I smoking cannabis. I still remember I bought an ounce of hash. It was £110 back then. Nowadays you can get that for what? £15, £20. The older, the older person that I actually met was one of my brother's best mate, really, and so called best mate that he was. But, um, so what happened was um, literally uh, he told me to work for him. Stop getting bullied or anything like that. I actually joined the crew sort of thing. Oh, in college. Um, when I was in college, first year, that's when I got introduced to heroin. I mean, come from school and that, and I was seeing, like, you know, um, on the way, when I got home, he'd be hanging around, you know, around the corner and that, and just literally around the corner from my house and that, and, you know, he would say to me all the time, like, you know, work for him and all that, and, but at the time, I didn't, you know, I didn't understand what he meant and all that. I was about 19, started smoking cocaine and all. So that's uh, two drugs. Started getting deep in the game. One of my brothers was selling the heroin. And uh, back then, it was uh, the phone just come out, page you got. We used to have pages anyway. He got me a phone and used to smoke weed every day. I see how much weed he had. And he goes to me, what do you want, do you want to do this? Because I knew what I was doing, you know. I even know, I knew like the weigh-ins and that back then we were selling it 40, 50 pound, half a gram, 90 pound a gram. So I picked up an eighth and I didn't even have a phone. All I had was the eighth. You see how you do with that? I went out there, started juggling that. I tripled my money in a day. Well, if you're not that, he would literally say to me, go and give it to a certain person or give it to somebody and, you know, it'd pass you money on. And basically that's what I did. And I was only about, what, 14, 15 at the time, I didn't have a clue, you know, what it was or anything like that, and at the time, I, you know, eventually I realised, you know, I mean, now I know what it was, eventually I was actually selling. What I'd done to him was pretty bad, you know, it wasn't nice, I shouldn't, you know, I bit, I bit his nose off, it wasn't nice, I'm not proud of it, judge sent me jail, my, judge sent me jail on my first offence for two years. The person I was actually working for, you know, he introduced me to it and he was like, you know, I have a try of it, you know, I, mean, you know, I, I smoked a spliff, I enjoyed it actually, you know, I literally enjoyed it and everything and, you know, it obviously it just started from there really and, um, you know, it started from one smoke, you know, smoking a spliff, then, you know, a spliff after a spliff, then after that, you know, it came to, you know, to it and smoking on foil. So, you know. I lost a lot, you know what I mean? I got kicked out from home, you know what I mean? Everything like that, because my parents had enough and all. And uh, so I was homeless. Clearing on average three grand a day. It was nothing, you know, it was nothing. She left me at that time. That was a bad time in my life where she left me in that. And, you know what I mean? I went downhill and the only thing I had to rely on was heroin. Shahid Farid, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Beijing. My name is Irfan Azad, I'm also a co-founder of Beijing. Uh, I first got involved in the project in 2004-2005. Um, um, basically it was a community engagement project. The Home Office had funded Basically, uh, 20 projects across the UK, and the UK were managing the projects into identifying heroin misuse amongst the Pakistani community. And they were looking for researchers, and Reading was one of the areas they had identified. But at the time, no one wanted to engage from the community to work with them, uh, primarily down to the stigmas attached to heroin misuse. 
Home Office funded it like Shahid was saying. They wanted the project to be part in the community and part in the prison. Um, one of the known prisons in Reading, uh, where a lot of um, offenders go to, is the HMP Bulletin in Vista. Uh, so we decided to um, send 15 of the 30 questionnaires to Bulletin Prison um, and 15 were done in the community. Um, myself and Shahid took the role for the community work because uh, of our engagement with her and users because of our own colourful backgrounds. Growing up in the west of Reading, um, but I spent the majority of my life in the east selling drugs. It's in the area where I used to do a lot of, a lot of drug dealing and uh, also in the later part of my life in crime. The police used to call it Zombie Town. Superintendent, Chief Area Commander, he, he described this as the Wild West. This, this street coming up um, is George Street. Majority of the houses have basement flats, and in the basement flats is where all the crack dealers used to supply crack. Um, I had I had a few people working in, the, in these areas as well. This is the notorious Oxford Road, known to drug dealers as Oki Road, known to heroin users and crack users as the Oki Road. This is really the heart of the drug culture. I just want to really tell you exactly where I used to stash some of my gear. It's blocked off now. It never used to be blocked off, but we can go with this little. Ain't no private back then. You like sheds. Well, normally new use for cars, but this one and this one used to have drugs in it. And we used to stash it on the roof of the, of the shed. But it's changed a lot. We used to burn out drug dealers' cars. Used to get burnt out here. This was this is the life we used to live: drug dealing, crime, just any anything to make money, which would make a lot of money, not not a little bit of some money. That's what we used to do. Okay, look in this way. Yeah. One, two, three. These are the last pictures of Robert, the 17-year-old, using a fake ID to get into Bar Mango with his back carrying knives. Robert didn't even make it to accident and emergency. He died here, aged just 17. You know, we just want people to be aware of knife crime and gun crime. It's happening in our cities, our towns, you know, wherever. It's not only major cities, it's happening everywhere, you know. We've got to try and cut it in the bud before it do blossom any further, you know? You can see here, it's all about drugs, guns, knives, murder, you know? Anything that happened to do with crime, we're against it. Respect a life, not a knife, which is true at all times. Robert Spence, who died here in town nearly three years ago, May come in, May the 2nd will be three years, and every day I miss him. Every day, every day, there's not a day pass I don't miss him. 
My name's Robin, uh, Robin Gardner. I'm working with the Home Office as uh, the Force Coordinator for Thames Valley um, on the Tackling Knives and Serious Youth Violence programme. Delighted because this is sort of like the fruition of uh, many months of, uh, uh, of work, certainly by the Bayesian guys, but also uh, by the Home Office putting money into it and other organisations. This is where they're going to be able to use a vehicle and, and what it all means on the cutting edge of uh, just exactly what it is that the Home Office is working on, trying to stop young people uh, carrying blades, sticking knives in each other and um, getting involved in, in gangs, guns and knives. I was selling crack, crack um, one night. Basically one night, Christmas Eve, I was known to sell crack. And uh, I came to see somebody down here, a uh, half-class guy, and um, he told me to drive down a bit. And he put, he was sitting in the back seat of my car, and he, and he, he came, he came to the, like, he stopped. when we stopped, he had a knife on him, and he put the knife like this into my neck, and he came around the car. As he came around the car, I tried, I tried throwing my money and the, the crack underneath my seat, which he saw. And without hesitation, he started stabbing me. And he started stabbing me in my chest from this angle. And it was raining at the time, Christmas Eve. I remember it clearly as it, as it happened yesterday. Um, I tried getting out of the car, as it was a scruffle. I managed to hit the blade and it landed somewhere near him. Um, as I got out of the car, uh, I can remember, as I got out of the car, it was raining. And um, there was uh, blood squirting out of my chest. I remember it was raining and I thought it was rain, but as I, as I looked down, it was, it was just pouring out of my chest um, and I was, lo I was getting a bit faint at the time and um, I dropped to the floor and then um, and then uh, I see the knife fall onto the floor um, and basically then after that I fell on the floor myself and the guy said to me, Happy Christmas, and he sliced my face and that was it. this football is um, to keep basically the youngsters off the streets and that um, when I was young this park here gave us a lot of opportunities all through the summer from morning to night we just used to spend our whole day in the park playing football and it used to pass time for us and we used to enjoy it and basically I was a very good footballer but through drugs um, I lost I went I got sidetracked through drugs and that and I just don't want it to happen to these um, youngsters